Hello everyone, welcome to topic one of SAS. Topic one will be looking at how do you present uh, the distribution of a given data set in various ways. Okay. okay, so in this topic, what we will be looking at is um, we are looking at six different parts. The first one is to state the relationship between population, sample, statistics, and probability. Second, we'll be looking at what is how do you use the distribution? How do you describe the distribution of a data set by computing its mean, mode, and um, median? How do you calculate the range in the quartile range, standard deviation, and standard error? Followed by what is central limits theorem and how can we use central limits theorem? Okay, the last one will be looking at confidence interval and confidence limit. Okay, before we can actually look at the relationship between a population, sample, statistics, and probability, we have to know what are these terms. A population is basically anything that we want to study. Okay, the problem is we cannot really quite study a population because it could be infinite. Let's say if you want to study the nutritional content or the nutritional value of McDonald's below fish or cheeseburger or whatever. Okay. That has no time limit, which means that you're studying the current filet fish that has yet to be sold, okay, and those that has been sold and eaten, and at the same time, those filet fish that has yet to be produced. So we can't actually do that if the time is infinite. Similarly, if you want to study the height of Singaporeans, of 18-year-old Singaporeans, we are talking about the current 18-year-old Singaporeans, the previous 18-year-old Singaporeans, which your parents are actually one of them in the past, and the future 18-year-old Singaporeans, including those that has yet to be born and will be 18-year-old in some time in the future. Okay. Now, rather than studying a population, we have this concept known as a sample. A sample is really just a subset of a population. So look at a population has many different subjects or many different entities. Sampling is then the process of selection for a sample. So a sample is actually a proper subset of a population. As mentioned before in the previous slide, the purpose of sampling is actually to, op to obtain a representative sample of a population and in order to use it for to make an inference about the population. So, for example, if you are trying to determine the average or the mean lifetime of batteries, you, you kind of know that the manufacturer can only test on a sample of the batteries rather than the entire batch of batteries. Why? Because from a commercial point of view, if you test all the batteries, then what is the manufacturer going to sell? Similarly, if you are doing food testing, Okay. Let's say that if in future one of you go to work in Nestle, Nestle, the factory, and your job is to test the Mars bars or the Snicker bars that's been produced, you cannot be testing the entire population because then you will require to test all the Mars bars or Snicker bars that's being produced, and then what are you going to what are you going to sell? You have to smash everything up, so you can't do that. So what is going to happen is, we tend to use this diagram. A population is what you want to study. Okay. Now, you extract or you isolate a sample from the population. So assuming that you are in, Mark, you are in um, Nestle and you are trying to study the nutritional content of Mars bars or Snicker bars, the sample could be one box of it. Okay. The sampling process Make sure that you have a representative, the sample must be representative of the population. Okay. This sampling is based on probability. From the sample itself, we want to infer back to the population. Okay. We, let's say if you are trying to study, um, you have a sample of mass bars, a box of mass bars. What you are trying to use from that box of mass bars Bus, is that you're going to infer what the factory has produced, what the manufacturer has produced. You're not that interested with just that box. Okay. That 
the inference and estimation is based on statistics. So a very important point for sampling is the sample must be representative of the population. So let me give an example. If you are trying to survey the opinions of students, okay, are you going to survey the opinion of students at in the canteen at 8.30? Is it representative of the whole student population? I will say no, because 8.30 is only those students who are early for class. So if a class starts at 9 o'clock, the students may not even make it to a canteen and they'll go for class first. So you're only um, surveying the populations of those students who are early for class to begin with. Okay. Or what happens if they have no class on that day? You know, all these things can make a big difference. After knowing the relationship between population, sample, probability and statistics, next we want to use it. Okay. Let's say you have a given set of data. How are we going to describe it? The first thing we can describe is using the mean, median and mode, which we have learned in secondary school. Before that, we have to look at what are the types of data. Essentially, data, there are four types of data or four different types of measurement. They are nominal, ordinal, interval and ratio. Nominal data is actually comes from word name. So nominal data itself cannot be averaged. For example, you have gender. Gender is a name. You cannot have 1.5 gender, 1.5 males, or 1.3 female. What does it mean? Other things is, for example, if I ask you for what is your favorite color, I ask the whole cohort what is your favorite color. I cannot have an average favorite color. Sounds a bit ridiculous. Ordinal comes from the root word order. So this can be arranged. It is a little bit like your student feedback. You have from um, strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree. There is an order. Okay. So the data can be arranged. We can still do some form of averaging, although it doesn't sound correct. Interval data, there's a meaning to the range. Interval means a range. For example, your GPA, your grades, Every interval has a range. For example, 71 to 79.9 is a A grade, no, is a B grade, and so on and so forth. So every range has a name for it and it has a meaning. Ratio data is unbinned data. So essentially, ratio data will be you have a continuous and uncontinuous data, height and weight. Every value has a different meaning to it. Usually, your nominal and ordinal data are discrete. That means it's um, whole numbers. Interval and ratio data can be continuous data. Okay. Okay. Once we know these um, the different data types, then we can talk about the mean, median, and mode. Mean itself, the word mean, generally refers to arithmetic mean which is basically the average. We denote the average in this symbol, x bar means the average of x. So I can write things like the average of height as height bar. Okay. Why do I say that mean generally refers to arithmetic mean? Because there are other definitions like geometric mean and harmonic mean. Median is when the data is sorted from um, descending order sorted based on descending order or ascending order, it is the middle value. That's why it's called median, the 50th percentile. Mode, on the other hand, is the most common value. Given any form of data set, you always have the mean and median. But you may not have mode or you can have multiple modes. For example, let's say if I want to, if my data set is the height of all the students in your class. Okay? I will definitely be able to calculate what is the average height. I will definitely be able to calculate what is the median height. But there may not be a mode height. If all of you um, differs in height by um, difference of at least one millimeter. Okay. Mean, median and mode is actually a very common use, a common measure of what we call as central tendency. That means what is the um, what is the typical value of a data set? 
Okay, as mentioned just now, central tendency is really the typical value of the data set. So what does typical value mean? Let's say if I say that the average marks of this class is 73 marks, it means that I'm subconsciously you expect that a randomly picked student to score around 73. Okay, that's what the average means. But how much around 73 do I expect you know, somewhere everyone to score between 71 to 75 or 68 to 78? Now, to answer this, I actually need another measure, which is called spread. How wide the values can be. So there are three, there's actually one, two, three, four spreads that we're covering. The range, interquartile range, which these two you've covered in secondary school. Standard deviation and standard error is something probably new at this moment. Okay, so measures of spread, in this case, we have four of them. There are actually more uh, measures of spread, but we'll talk about only these four. Range, interquartile range, standard deviation, and standard error. They are just measure of how wide, how similar the values are. Okay, so let's say the average of this class is 73. How, if I take all the, all the um, scores, how close is it to 73 or is it very far apart? Range itself is just the maximum value minus the minimum value. So the low, the highest scoring student versus the lowest scoring student. This is actually not a very fantastic measure because range can be actually affected by extreme values. Maybe out of all your, in your entire class, all of you except one student score between 70 to 80 and one student scored 95 then the range will be stretched out by that one higher scoring student or the other way around as well so range is actually not a very good um, measure of spread and extreme values is just what i mentioned just now interquartile range interquartile range comes from your median so you are taking a sorted value whether is it sorted ascending, uh, in ascending order or descending order, it is actually the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile, or usually known as the third quartile minus the first quartile. That is in the quartile range. Okay, after sorting out or uh, going through what is range in the quartile range, we talk about the third one, which is standard deviation. Now, standard deviation has a related term called variance. Okay. Step variance is essentially the square of standard deviation or in other words standard deviation is just the square root of variance. Okay. These are more useful. So there's actually two formula. One for population, two formula for variances. One for population variance denoted as sigma square. This, um, this side is called sigma. So Population standard deviation is sigma. Okay. Another formula for sample variance, which is S squared. So st sample standard deviation is S. Let's look at the two formula. You realize that in order to calculate standard deviation or variance, you need the arithmetic mean to begin with. Okay. So what is the difference formula? It's just the denominator. Standard um, population variance, you, the denominator is sample size. But sample standard sample variance, the denominator is m minus 1. So think about it. You actually just need minimally two data points, two readings in order to calculate sample variance. In other words, two readings to calculate sample standard deviation. Lastly, we come to a last um, item, which is called standard error. Now, standard error is a little bit more tricky. In short, standard error by definition is the standard deviation of multiple means. What do I mean by this? Let's look at this diagram that we have before. You have your population and within a population, you have a sample. So we will use this diagram to explain the difference between a standard deviation and standard error. 
Now, within a population, I can have one sample. So, I just name this sample as S1. This sample, I can then calculate what is the sample mean. Okay, The subscript S1 is just to denote this, uh, the sample is called S1. I can also calculate the sample uh, standard deviation for this sample itself. Okay. Okay, so we have a population. Just now I took out one sample. It also means that I can actually take out more multiple samples. So I can take four samples, five samples, ten samples, it doesn't matter. Each sample allows me to calculate its own sample mean and its own stand sample standard deviation. So from sample two, it has a sample mean for sample two, standard deviation for sample two, and so on and so forth. What you would know we realize is that because every sample is slightly different, they are not identical. This means that it will also result in the four sample means, these four sample means, to be numerically close to each other, but they are not as equal to each other. So these four values will, these four sample means will be very close, but they are not equal to each other. Next is if I take these four sample means, since these four sample means are just values, okay, I can kind of put them in a virtual um, sample, a sample of sample means. And then what I can do is I can calculate the mean of the means, the average of these four averages. The mean of the means is also known as the grand mean. Okay. This is something that you'll be covering in topic number 4. And since we can calculate the, the mean of the means, we can also calculate the standard deviation of the means. Here I denote it as S subscript X bar. Okay. The standard deviation of the means is also known as the standard error. Okay, so you may ask, why is this grand mean, the mean of means, and the standard error, which is the standard deviation of the means, so important? Okay. It is because of a very important concept in statistics called the central limit theorem. It's a central limit theorem that makes it very important. Now, what central limit theorem state is that the distribution of the, sam of the sample means it will approximate a normal distribution if the sample size is larger, regardless of what the shape of the underlying distribution is. Okay. You can pause here for a few seconds and reread this sentence again and think about what it means before I explain to you what it really means. Okay, before we can really understand what central limit theorem means, because it talks about this thing called normal distribution. So what is normal distribution? We have to understand normal distribution first. Normal distribution is commonly known as the bell curve. Okay, Now, it's named normal distribution. Distribution is like a histogram. There is actually nothing special, nothing normal about normal distribution. Okay, So I use inverted commas. Okay. Other than normal distribution is a very common distribution and it is actually the core of all statistics. So what I'm trying to say is the first thing you have to learn about statistics is to understand what normal distribution is and know it very well. The rest of statistics is actually within um, your grasp. Okay, I'm sure some of you have seen this diagram before. This is what normal distribution is like. And this is what we call as a standard normal distribution. Not just a normal distribution, but the standard normal distribution. So you have the mean, which is 0, plus minus 1 standard deviation, plus minus 2 standard deviation, and plus minus 3 standard deviation. What I will do is, because this is a, there's a mathematical equation for this line, and you learned in your mathematics, if you do an integration, you are finding the area under the curve. So if I plot the area under the curve to be 100% of the total area, then normal distribution plus minus 1 standard deviation will have a certain area. And this area is actually very important. 
what it what normal distribution then state is if all the data about 69 8 percent okay is 34.1 plus a 4.1 so it's about 68 percent of the all the data points should fall under plus minus one standard deviation of the mean so since you're able to calculate what is the arithmetic mean you know you're able to calculate the standard deviation plus minus one standard deviation of the mean will have about 68 percent of all your data points plus minus two standard deviation you get 68 percent plus 30 13.6 percent plus 13.6 percent you end up with nearly 96 percent of all the data points is plus minus two standard deviation and plus minus three standard deviation will be almost everything 99.8 percent so this is actually a very central part of statistics okay and that is what makes normal distribution so important now let's go back after knowing what normal distribution is let's go back and reread what central limits theorem says it states that the distribution of the sample means okay from population i have multiple samples distribution of these sample means is approximately a normal distribution if the sample size is large regardless of what the underlying distribution is so what does it really say is i do not care what is the actual distribution of the data points in the population but the sam distribution of the sample means will be normally distributed that means the means of multiple samples will be normally distributed so everything regardless of what the the distribution is everything falls back into normal distribution and that is what makes central limits theorem so powerful and that's what makes normal distribution so critically important okay let me just give you an example let's say i have a regular die okay the die dice is plural die is single the regular six-sided die that you use for your monopoly and whatsoever if i were to toss it five thousand times i will record it i will get a histogram that looks something like this okay because the probability of every number of every outcome will be almost the same okay five thousand times divided by six is about 800 plus so it'll be almost the same however if i were to do a sampling that's assuming that this five thousand times is a population in fact population is infinite right assuming it's 500 um, is a is a population 5000 is a population so if i just randomly group every 10 tosses as one sample i will have 500 samples 5000 tosses divide by 10 toss per sample i have 500 samples if i calculate what is the average number for each of these 10 tosses i will plot it out and it looks a little bit like a normal distribution now okay you realize that the average of the 10 toss is somewhere between 3.3 .3 and 3.5 okay so i can calculate what it is the average of a number of toss so this is where from a uniform distribution this is what we call it a uniform distribution i get to a normal distribution of the sample means this is what central limits theorem is powerful okay let me represent central limits theorem and what it really means in another way so i have a population i don't care what is the distribution of the items i want to study it can be normally distributed it can be left skewed right skewed it doesn't matter right left skew could be your things like your marks right skew you know, can be something else Okay. it can be normally uniformly distributed like your um your die toss it can be bimodal it can be multimodal it can be any form of distribution but within this population as long as i take multiple samples and each one i calculate a sample means so here i only show four i could do 10 i could do 100 i could do a thousand the distribution of this sample means will be normally distributed 
So this is where the strength lies. So let's come back to this diagram again. We have the grand mean or the mean of means and the standard deviation of the means, which is also the standard error. What is interesting is the population, it can be infinite sample, but there is such a thing as the true or real population mean, which we will never know. However, we can estimate. We can estimate the population mean if we have multiple samples because the grand mean will be very close to the true population mean. Okay, the grand mean or the mean of means will be very close to the true population mean even if it is infinite. It is used to estimate. However, if we have done the sampling properly, it means that these four sample means will be pretty close to each other. Okay? And since they are very pretty close to each other, it means that, it infer that, or implies that, any of the sample means can be used to estimate the population mean. There are some errors, yes. Why do we want to do that? In reality, most of us, we are not going to have multiple samples. We only have one sample. So we take the sample mean to estimate the population mean. Okay. And more importantly, we can actually estimate what is the standard error, the standard, the standard error, which is the standard deviation of the means from any one of the sample means. It's an estimation. Okay, it's given by this formula. The standard error is actually approximate to the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Okay, the sample size of the sample. So we, this is why the larger the sample, the more valuable it is because you are dividing by a larger number, square root of a larger number, and that reduces your um, standard error. Okay, so we have learned quite a fair bit already. And um, let's apply all this knowledge in practice and in some form of calculation. Here we are going to compute what is this, this thing called confidence interval, confidence limits, based on what we already know. So let's say we have a set of data. For example, I give you the height of 30 students. So these are the height in centimeters. What can you do about it? Okay, the first thing you ask me is, why do we need 30 data points? We'll deal with it in chapter 4. Okay, not, at this moment, not at this moment. Okay, so anyway, we have the heights of um, 30 students. What can you do about it? Okay. We can calculate what we call as descriptive statistics. We can describe the data. Okay. We have 30, 30 data points, so our n sample size is 30. We can calculate the mean, we can calculate the median, we know the range, we can calculate the standard deviation. The formulas are given. You can do it in Excel, you can do it in R, you can do it in any other program, even your calculator as well. So we know all this. So, so besides the descriptive statistics, which is okay, based on the given data set, what is the mean, what is the standard deviation, what is the mode, what is the median, what is the variance, whatsoever. Okay, what can we do about it? Okay. How can we use normal distribution here, assuming that the data is normally distributed? Okay. What we can actually do is to estimate what is the confidence interval of student height. Okay. If the sample is representative of the student population, okay. this is an uh, assumption that we have to make. What, is, what can we use to estimate? Then we can use it to estimate the confidence interval. So what is confidence interval? Confidence interval basically has two different parts. One is a confidence, one is an interval. Confidence means how certain you are. 100% means you are full certainty. 0% means you are not certain. So, and an interval is a range. So confidence interval has two parts, a confidence in terms of percentage and a range. Now recall that in normal distribution, what it says is, 68% of all the data points is plus minus one standard deviation and 
96% of the data points is plus minus 2 standard deviation about nearly all the data points, 99.8% of all the data points is plus minus 3 standard deviation. We use this now. How are we going to apply it to our um, heights of students? Okay, given that 96, about 96% of all the data points is plus minus 2 standard deviation, I've mentioned a few times, from the descriptive statistics, the average height of the 30 students is 1.72.33 centimeters and the standard deviation is 4.957 centimeters. So in another words, I will expect 96% of all the students to be 1.172.33 centimeters plus minus 2 times 4.957 centimeters tall. You do the maths yourself, it means that I'm expecting 96% of all the students to have the height between 1.625, 1.62.4 something, to 1.22182.2 centimeters tall. Okay. Now, <clears throat> 96 is then the confidence. So the 96% confi confidence interval of the student height is between 1.6. 162.416 centimeters to 182.244 centimeters. Okay. So you could actually be asking me how what does this mean then? How what will happen if I want to increase or decrease the confidence? We'll look at that soon. So very often instead of calculating the 96% confidence interval, we calculate the 95% confidence interval. Okay. Now, 95% confidence interval is about plus minus 1.96 standard deviation instead of plus minus 2, which means that I will expect 95% confidence interval of the student height to be 162.614 centimeters to 182.046 centimeters. If you have not um, understood what's, what's happened, I want to, what I'm trying to show you is what happened when I, when I changed the confidence interval. Okay. We have the same mean and standard deviation. So if you look at that, 96% confidence interval is about 1.162.4 uh, to 182.4. But 95% confidence interval is about 162.6 instead of 0.4 to 182.0. Okay. This means that the more confidence you want, the larger the range. Inversely, smaller range will give you high, uh, lower confidence. So you can probably be asking, why don't we have 100% confidence? Actually, we cannot. Okay. Because normal distribution does not touch the x-axis. So there's no 100 it goes to negative infinity to positive infinity. It is a little bit like saying, which one is more useful? Is it more useful to tell you that 95% of the marks, 95% <clears throat> of the exam marks is between 50 to 70? Or 100% of the exam marks is between 0 to 100? Which one is more useful? Obviously the first one. 90 or 95 percent is between 50 to 70. So yeah, at least you have a usable range rather than the total total range. Moving on, we have actually calculated what is the 95 percent confidence interval of individual student heights. But can we calculate 95 percent confidence interval for average student height? Okay. Average student height is actually quite useful. That means you get a sample. What is the 95% confidence interval of this average student height? For this, we have to go back to central limits theorem. Okay. So in order to do that, we actually can predict, incorporate the learning objective to predict the sample means and the data values using your central limits theorem. What is then the difference in calculation between 95% confidence of the individual student height versus 
95% confidence interval of average student height. Okay. Using central limits theorem, what do we do? 95% confidence interval of the data points, individual student height, is actually plus minus 1.96 standard deviation. But 95% confidence interval of the average data points is actually 1.96 of standard error. It's not standard deviation now, we are using standard error for average data points. You use standard deviation for the data points. Okay. I repeat again, if you want to find the confidence interval of individual data points, okay, individuals to individual something, we use standard deviation. If we want to find out the, the confidence interval of average data points, we have to use standard error. Okay. Now you can recall that we can approximate the standard error from the standard deviation of the sample. So we can actually use this now. So let's calculate and see what happens. We have the mean height is 173.33 centimeters and the standard deviation is 4.957 centimeters which means that the standard error will be 4.957 divided by square root of 30 30 being the sample size we have 30 students okay. so the standard error is 0 0.905 therefore the average 95 percent confidence interval of the average student height is between uh, just one 173.33 plus minus 1.96 times 0 0.905, which then gives you 171.556 centimeters to 175.104 centimeters. What does this really mean? Okay. Vaguely, it can be vaguely translated to if I take another sample, the second sample of 30 students, I am 95% confident, confident that the average height of this second sample is between 171.5, 171.6 .1 to 175.1 something centimeters. Okay. Do not get confused with what we did for a random student okay, versus uh, this. I'm 95% confident that the height of a random student. Okay, I keep stressing this. This you're talking about random student. This you're talking about average of a group of students they are very different okay you have to be clear about these two um, what is distinguished between these two um, sentences okay so as some of you might have realized i use the the phrase vaguely translated to okay second sample of 30 students i'm 95 percent confident that the average height of these 30 students is somewhere between here. Now, why do I use the phrase vaguely translated to? Because this is actually a usable interpretation, but it's actually a wrong interpretation. Yes, you got it correct. It is a usable but wrong interpretation. Now, the actual interpretation is actually very difficult to understand. Okay. So I give you the actual, the correct interpretation. It simply means that if I take multiple samples, okay, pop, student population is large, I can take multiple samples. I can take 100 samples, 1,000 samples, doesn't matter. 100 samples, let's say. And for each sample, I construct a 95% confidence interval of the means. So I have 195% confidence interval of the means. Correct. What it really means, what it really implies, is that 95% of these constructed 95% confidence interval of the means will contain the true population mean. Okay, I leave this for you to read again. What is the correct interpretation and what is the wrong but usable interpretation? You can pause here or let me read for you again. The correct interpretation should be if multiple samples were taken, say for example, 
100 samples were taken and 95% confidence interval of means were constructed for each of these 100 samples. Then, 95% of the constructed, 95% confidence interval of the means. In another, in another words, 95 of the 100 constructed, 95% confidence interval of the means will then contain the true population mean, which is actually the, the real average height of the students if you measure the entire population. Now, it's a bit of tongue twister, but that's actually what the whole confidence interval of the means really means. Okay, so this is a big, long sentence. I will repeat it here again. If you want to read it, you can pause, pause and reread it. So I'm going to describe to you what it really try to say. Try to say. Assuming that I will never know what is the real or true or actual population sample, population average of heights, correct? Because I cannot measure all the students. So assuming that this red line is the actual real um, population mean, okay? I have multiple samples, sample 1, sample 2, sample S3, S4, all the way to S something, 100, let's say. Each one, I construct a 95% confidence interval. Okay, You'll find that if I have 100 samples, 95, 95 of these 100 constructed confidence interval will actually contain the value, con will actually encapsulate and close the true population mean here. So what are the other five? For example, here, sample 3. This dotted line is actually out of the true population mean. So I miscalculated. It's actually missampled. Sample 7 is also out of it. The rest of it, sample 6, is the 95% confidence interval is actually within it, and so on and so forth. So this is actually what the whole thing is. This also implies that, please do not ever say that the true population mean is what? you will never know. You can only say that we estimate the true population mean to be what? It is always an estimation. You never know what is the true mean. You can only estimate what is the true mean. Okay. Now with that, I've completed the first topic. Thank you very much. We will see you in topic two. Bye-bye.